Okay, so we're all set. So I now introduce Tim Cooper to lead us in a talk called Evolution versus Creation. Tim. Well, thanks, Joe, for the introduction. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank our friends for joining us online through this public seminar. The conversation this morning, uh, while using scripture, our focus is going to be looking more in a nature theme and a science theme to understand the basis of evolution versus creation. And as the ad that you may have seen says, we're really looking to see which portion or which theory, which belief requires more faith. What does it take more faith to believe in? We would ask that as you go through this this evening with us, that you would have an open mind as you go through the class. You know, we noticed the Bible verse that we have on the screen this morning for us. It's from Romans, and uh, it does seem to predict a time when the human race would rather worship the creation rather than believing in a creator. I'm just going to read that quickly for you. We're going to touch on it one more time later in the, in the seminar this evening. It says, worship and serve the creature more than the creator itself. And that's Romans 1 verse 25. And we can see that this is very prevalent today as the belief in the theory of evolution is quite significant. And so seeing as we're going to use the word faith, and that's really going to be the measuring stick this evening of what requires more faith, we want to see where that comes from. And really, if you know the Bible at all, or if you may have heard this, faith is, comes from Hebrews chapter 11, the description of faith, that is. And it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So for anyone who would believe in a creation, it requires a great deal of faith because we were not present at the creation. And to have faith in creation is to believe and to be responsible to a creator and praising and serving him. It really changes or should change the way in which we live our lives. There's a calling there. We're going to talk about that. And so we see two pretty significant words in this verse. We see hope for, we see the word evidence and not seen. And so hope for, there seems to be a promise there. We're going to touch on that a little bit later on as well. But it is, it is a promise that we're looking to see, a promise that we want to see in the future. And there's that evidence. And the evidence is all around us. That's the nature. We're going to look at that as well. There is a great deal of evidence to what we should be believing in. And that there is a requirement to believe in a creator. And that's what we really want to get down to. Sorry, I didn't click the slide there. This evening, we approach this topic with hopefully an open mind and our Bibles in our hands, as there will be at the end, especially a few verses that we want to take a look at. But we do want to hope and we do hope to provide an objective, practical look at the theory of evolution and the biblical teaching of creation. We want to consider the observable evidence around us and weigh in to see which holds more merit and which is worthy of our faith and our hope. What are we going to put our hope in? And hopefully at the end of the seminar this evening, and this is pretty important, we want to ask ourselves that question. Where will we put our faith? Where are we going to look to see for hope in the future? You know, in the world that we live in today, all the chaos, everything going on, it's pretty important for us to have hope. Pretty important for us to be able to look forward to something. And that's really a lot of what this consideration comes down to. And so what are we going to look at? What are some points of consideration that we're going to look at this evening? Well, we will be using science and considering nation, or na sorry, considering natural observation to test the credibility of the theory of evolution and the biblical teaching of creation. And so what is that going to entail? What are, what are we actually going to break this down to? And so it is, what is natural selection? Where do we see 
the practicality of evolution in nature. We're going to look at mutation. We're going to look at its observable results. And we're going to spend not a great deal of time, but some time looking at the question of old Earth versus new Earth. How old is the planet that we're living on? I would like to make the point, uh, I am in no way a scientist, but I have taken or I have the ability to just ask simple questions, simple understandings, and take a very simple, very basic look at this subject. And so as you continue to peel that back, the more and more you get into it, you're going to realize that there's more and more evidence that does seem to go in one direction. And so a test of faith, that's what we've entitled this slide. So many would advocate that the theory of evolution negates the existence of a creator. It doesn't, there's no more a need for the creator, evolution takes care of it. To, to test this, however, we want to begin with a very simple question. This is one question I asked my science teacher in grade 10 and uh, never really got an answer. Where does the space dust come from? You see, both creation and evolution seem to require a belief in a creator. Whether it's for the dust that is collected and creates pressure and forms the Big Bang Theory that then explodes and starts evolution over the billions of years, or as we read in the creation story in Genesis that the dust of the earth man was formed, there is this unexplainable catalyst at the beginning of both the evolution and the creation origin. And that catalyst is dust. Where does it come from? And see, we're going to hit on this a few times this evening, but they're in this argument, in this conversation, every time I have this conversation with an evolutionist, every time I would have this conversation with creationists, there is a great deal of pressure put on just the creation side that we must have all the answers. I want to make sure that that same amount of pressure would be applied on yourself if you're an evolutionist watching this to have to answer some of these same questions. This is a very simple question. Where does the dust come from? And so obviously evolution also requires a great deal of faith in order to believe in it. And so we're just gonna continue. We're, we're not gonna answer these in any uh, distinct detail, but we just have a few more questions as we look out into the galaxy we look around us, even on this earth, we look into fossil records. Here's just a couple quick questions. If the solar system evolved or resulted from a singular bang, when we look at our planets, why do three of the planets spin backwards and why do at least six of the moons revolve backwards? So you would think if the explosion went out in one direction, everything would move in that same direction. And what is so interesting is recently, there are entire galaxies now that have been found that are spinning in the opposite direction. Another question, where are the billions of transitional fossils that should exist? If all current species evolved through the ages, there should be clear fossil records of transitional stages. Why don't we see a reasonably smooth continuous uh, continuum among all living creatures or in all the fossil records of both? And I think really importantly that goes along with this, who are the evol evolutionary ancestors to the insects? Every fossil with the insects, they are the exact same. There doesn't seem to be an evolutionary process with the insects. Why is that the case? If everything has evolved, why would this be the case? And if anyone has children, you uh, obviously know how genetics work. You generally have a child that is very similar and has similar attributes and similar looks. And it does beg to the question, where is this evidence that the information that is stored in DNA could ever assemble itself. You know, thousands of books worth of coded information that are in your tiny, tiny trillions of cells. How is this possible? And we asked the question as well, how dangerous is a belief in evolution? It may seem innocent, but there is a calling to serve a creator. And there are consequences for ignoring that call. We're just gonna do a couple quick Bible verses. And so here's Romans chapter 6, verses, uh, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Another verse here in Romans, and this is actually 
uh, where we got the title slide verse from. So we're going to read just a little bit bigger section, but consider this and think about our, our, the world around us today and whether we have this calling to, to a creator. Think of this in this context, Romans chapter one, verses 20 to 25. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That's nature, the visible things being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they know God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served a creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. We're just going to repeat that last little bit who changed the truth of God, that is creation, that is the truth of God, there is a God, into a lie and worship and serve the create the creature more than the creator. Here's an interesting quote that we want to take a look at, and this is from the Wall Street Journal in 2014. So this is a pretty recent quote, we're not going back very far. Today there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole entire thing falls apart. We're just gonna give you a couple of those parameters. Air mixture, you know, CO2, oxygen, nitrogen, the water that we have, the temperature on earth. There's a huge conversation going on right now about what is happening with the temperature on earth and the fact that we might not be able to survive if it's not fixed. The tilt of the earth. Without a massive planet like Jupiter, here's an example, without a massive planet like Jupiter nearby, whose gravity will draw away asteroids a thousand times as many would hit the Earth's surface. The odds against life in the universe are simply astonishing. Yet here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Can every one of those many parameters have been perfect by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that science suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces. Doesn't assuming that an intelligent created, uh, that an intelligence created these perfect conditions require far less faith than believing that a life sustaining earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds to come into being. And so what we wanna move into here for a second and really it is one of the fairly large proof that we have is we want to take a look at a few different animals that seem to disprove evolution, or at least we want to take a look at, you know, really question how could these animals have ever evolved? The primary belief in evolution, we just really want to put this up here. This is a theory, by the way. The primary belief of evolution is that evolution is a change in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. These characteristics are the expression of genes that are passed on from parent to offspring during reproduction. And therefore, as we consider an animal, we must consider how it would have survived over a long period of time through various transitional stages, especially when parts of its existence or survival are based on their unique attributes as well as the animal's origin. And so that's very important for us to consider. If evolution happens over a long period of time because a gene and a, you know, a set gene comes through and that's what makes that animal special to survive, we must consider how would that have been possible? How would they have been able to gather food? How would they have been able to travel? How would they have been able to reproduce through the special means that they have? And I think we're only going to take a look at four examples. There are plenty of examples out there. You can, you know, if, if you're watching this, you can start to think through some of the amazing animals that are in nature around us. We're going to take a look at, at a few examples. We're going to take a look at the woodpecker first. So the woodpecker has a very unique shock absorber in the beak and the skull providing protection from severe migraine headaches slash death that might otherwise result from its attempt at collecting food. If anybody has been out in nature, you hear that knocking, you're wondering if somebody's knocking on the door and it's a woodpecker hammering its head against a log trying to find food. 
It has special shaped claws to cling to the tree. You can actually see them, the great picture on the slide there. You can actually see that those trees, or that, sorry, those claws are to cling to the tree to secure it, um, secure them in their habitat. Even more amazing, they have super long tongues to access food. They're chasing the food down through the tree using their tongue. And it, perhaps even more impressive, they have a thick skull as well to preserve their brain from the impact-based trauma that they would have. One more thing that's not on the slide up there, and you can see it, is the tail feathers in a woodpecker are incredibly stiff. And what that is, is to actually be the other support for the woodpecker as it's hammering its head. So all of these aspects, however, are super vital for the survival of their very existence. I don't understand how a woodpecker could possibly have evolved. What part came first? All of these aspects are needed in order for it to hunt and for it to gather its food. How, and we must ask ourselves, however could this animal have evolved? It would have starved to death and died without the process of collecting food. We have the dolphin here next. The dolphin and whales, in fact, we should have a picture of dolphins up there. But you have to consider that there is a massive transition uh, that uh, evolutionists would have to account for in the dolphin. And really what that's based on is that the dolphin and whales are air breathing animals that live in the ocean. And so therefore you would have to consider that if they did come from somewhere, they would have to come from a mammal type animal. And therefore that transitional uh, to water would be in, incredible. In fact, here's a few that would have had to happen. The nose would have had to move back in the head. Uh, they would have had feet, claws or tail that would then have been exchanged for fins and flippers, which now we're getting into pretty massive. It would have to develop a torpedo shaped body for fish and swimming in the water. And here's where it starts to get uh, pretty amazing. Some of these are huge. It would have to be able to drink seawater and desalinize it, which is significant. Its entire bone structure and metabolism would have to be rearranged. And probably most important for the dolphin, it would have to develop a sophisticated sonar system in order to search for food. Again, just like we asked with the woodpecker, how on earth would this mammal have evolved or this, this dolphin have evolved? How would that have ever happened? How could this animal have survived? And again, on our side or the creationist side of things, the duckbill platypus is an amazing example. It's, it's about 20 different animals put into one here. You're gonna see a few examples. It is a fur bearing mammal. It lays eggs and yet, however, suckles its young, which is, which is very, very weird. It has duck-like bill, um, which inside of the duck-like bill has a built-in heat-sensitive worm-finding radar. Its tail is like a beaver, however, it is actually furry. It has webbed feet on the front and clawed feet on the rear, so two different types of feet. The reproductive systems are uniquely uh, different from the rest of the animal world, and, but mostly mammalian in nature. The only other known egg-laying mammal is the spiny anteater. And except for the fact that these two animals lay eggs, they literally uh, could not be more different than they are. And there is a, a form of poison that the platypus uh, can actually put out as well in its rear claw. And so we ask ourselves, where did this animal evolve from? Where could we possibly have seen this animal evolve? Its food, its reproductive system, the way it looks, some of the attributes that it have. We do have to ask ourselves, we have to wonder, was this perhaps an animal that was left for us to consider just how challenging it might be for something like this animal to evolve? We, we wonder if that had been left for us. And this little bird, now the hummingbird, we're going to go to next. You know, the hummingbird is a very amazing bird. We all have them around our houses, at least up here in Manitoulin and we do. And it has so many amazing characteristics. We actually have given two pages to the hummingbird. In the feathers, the quill is considered stronger for its weight than any structure that can be designed by a man. It has flexibility of the quill allows the primary feathers at the wingtip to bend upward with each downbeat of the wing. And this produces the equivalent of pitch in a helicopter. The quill constantly changes shape to meet the requirements of air pressure and wing position. 
The leading vein of the feather is narrower than the traveling vein. This feather causes the wing to operate like a propeller to give both lift and propulsion. The wing is an efficient double jointed foresail, the inner half sloping at a slight angle to give lift like the wing of an airplane, while the outer half acts like a propeller. And there is a jet assisted takeoff mechanism, a, a, a tuff of feathers at the junction of the wing, which adds extra airfoil surface for the landing and takeoff. Like I said, we're gonna have a second one here because there's just so much. It has enlarged muscles to operate the wings, almost three quarters of the weight of the bird are these enlarged muscles. It has higher metabolism, temperature, blood pressure, and a hyperactive heart, which contributes to the bird's success. I think this one's probably one of the fairly remarkable ones. A remarkable system of respiration where the hollow bones provide an air sac system, providing buoyancy and a reserve for respiration and an air conditioner. And perhaps the most interesting is that air flows into the lung in only one direction, providing a continuous supply of oxygen. That is super amazing. And it has many other features, camouflage, migration, hibernation, unbelievable. All of these factors are at play when we look at, and we look out our windows and we see one of these birds, these hummingbirds just floating there, sucking on that sugary drink that we hang out for them. All of these things are happening in microseconds, all happening at once for that bird to just sit there and hover. And again, with all you know, two pages of special attributes for just one bird, we have to ask ourselves, how could this thing have possibly evolved? The blood pressure, the one, one way flow of oxygen, all of these things, the, the buoyancy, the different operation of the wings, it, it, it's almost unbelievable the amount of special attributes this bird has. And then we ask ourselves, how could this bird have evolved? Where did it come from? What else looks like a hummingbird? So here is, we wanna move along here. We're gonna go on to the next section and that is uh, natural selection. The process whereby organisms better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. The theory of his action was first fully expounded by Charles Darwin and is now believed to be the main process that brings about evolution. I, I, want, to, I want to say, I do believe in natural selection. I'm gonna give you an, an example of natural selection in a little bit to where it can um, change the ecosystem that we're living in right now. And so I, I'm not saying natural selection isn't real. To consider, however, that natural selection would have made any of the four animals that we just talked about, I, I really find that to be an absolute stretch. In fact, what's pretty amazing is so did Charles Darwin himself. Here's a quote. To suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, Absurd in the highest degree. Charles Darwin, 1872. Natural selection, well, it does work in some extent. You know, consider crossbreeding different dogs. You can develop a new dog breed. You can definitely do that. But you can never have a dog develop into a cat or another species. DNA does not change. I promised that I was going to talk about natural selection. You'll see on that screenshot there um, a little red circle. And it's very hard to make out. And we're going to find out that that is a white moth and a black moth. And, uh, and over the next few slides, you'll see how natural selection is something that does occur, occur. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the white moth comprised 99% of the moth population. The white moths were protected by their ability to blend in with the light color lichens, which lived on the dark of trees. The black moth, as you can see in the picture, were much more visible against the light background and therefore more susceptible to being eaten by birds. In fact, the dark moth only comprised 1% of the population. Consequently, the black variety did not have as great a chance to reproduce, increase their numbers, and the white variation was much more fit. Thus, the frequency of the dark was very low, less than 1%, and maintained primarily by a spontaneous mutation from light to dark allies. However, and you can see the picture has flipped here, now you can really see the white moth. During the later part of the 19th century, as the Industrial Revolution began, smoke particles produced by developing industry began to gradually darken the trunk of the trees, 
on which the moss rest, in addition to light colored lichens covered the trees were killed by the sulfur dioxide emissions from new coal burning mills and factory. This change in environment caused the white moss to become more visible and more likely to be eaten by birds while the black form became better camouflaged. This situation led to a decrease in population of the white moss while the black moss were better able to breed and therefore increase their numbers. In 1848, the dark, the dark moss comprised 1% of the population and by 1959, they presented 90% of the population. And so in 100 years, the frequency of dark moss increased by a thousand fold. That is a perfect example of natural selection. That is very real, that does happen. But in no way does that prove the theory of evolution. This is a quote from a pretty prominent, obviously uh, passed away now, but a pretty prominent, prominent biologist. I found it uh, pretty interesting. It says the probability of life originating from accident is comparable to the probability of an unbridged dictionary resulting from an explosion in a printing shop. That's Edwin Conklin. And that is in reference to the Big Bang Theory. All right, so we wanna move along to mutation. And uh, you'll see up on the screen there, it's a very simple, simple equation. You have a box with four small dots in it. And you'll see that it is a pretty good representation of mutation because whenever you have a mutation, you have the same box, but you have less. It never creates more. And we're just gonna go over that in a second. So um, as the slide says, even when mutations do occur, they only scramble the genetic information that is already there. No mutation has yet been found that increased the genetic information. When mutations do occur, they only scramble the genetic information. And we got an example here, a poor fellow up there, that is a, a sheep um, with a, a fifth leg. You know, a mutation may cause a sheep to have a fifth leg, but this is not evolution. This sheep already had the DNA to make a leg. This is just a mistake that occurred, which was caused by mutation. Mutations would not allow this sheep to grow wings. It would not allow it to evolve into a bird. A, a sheep does not have and cannot produce the necessary genetic information to produce a wing. Mutations are almost always detrimental. A sheep with a fifth leg is no better off than it was before. It cannot run faster and it most certainly cannot produce any extra wool. Dr. Lee Spetmore, he is a scientist and a teacher at John Hopkins University, uh, speaks on the lack of new information produced by mutation in his book, Not By Chance. He writes, in all the reading I've done in the life of science literature, I have never found a mutation that added information. This man is not a student slack in his research. He's well-educated in science in the area of mutation. He goes on to say that upon closer, more in-depth in investigation, all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not increase it. This is exactly opposite of what evolutionists claim. They claim that mutation caused single cell organisms to evolve into people. How could a single cell organism evolve into anything if a mutation could only cause it to lose genetic information? Evolution demands that mutations produce new information but mutations cannot and do not provide new information. Some evolutionists like Pierre Paul Gross are starting to see this flaw in the theory. Gross is on record saying, no matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. Mutations only corrupt the information already present, leaving the organism with less genetic information and in all regards, a lower chance of survival. And so we want to take a, a look at old earth versus new earth. What does the Bible have to say? We're going to start there. And so in Genesis chapter one, verses one and two, we, we do see a kind of a preface to the creation story. We see in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so we are able to see 
Uh, we see this interesting without form, without void, there was water. What period of time could this have been? How long was this? You know, there's a, there's a great deal of pondering that can happen. You know, we have, we have three things that we know are there. The earth's there, the heaven's there, so space is there, the earth is there. We know that there was water. We just don't know how long a period of time that is. But it is interesting to ponder, of course. We always love to have these conversations. But the reality is we just don't know. It is fun, or I don't know if it's fun, or, but if it's interesting to have this discussion, but perhaps we're just not supposed to fully know this or have this answer until, you know, the, the time of hope or the time of the kingdom is to come. And we'll be given that answer from our creator. We are going to, to go into a few things that, that would talk about uh, age of the earth and, and where my feeling would be on it and where, where we would, you know, take our information from. It is interesting that fossils have proven that there are dinosaurs. And we ask ourselves, could they have been on the earth in this creation? You know, I, I don't want to go and, and be a creationist that says dinosaurs aren't real. They're pulling dinosaurs out of the ground right now with skin on them still. So the reality is, is dinosaurs are real. Dinosaurs were created. They, they are here. You know, something that's interesting, though, is the Bible does also mention that the unicorn 18 times. You know, one Bible verse says God brought them forth out of Egypt, he has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, talking about a unicorn. Uh, we obviously do not have unicorns with us anymore. The Bible also mentions the dragon 25 times. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of the dragons and covered us in the shadow of the depths. I have no idea what the dragon looked like, but we don't have something today that we would call a dragon. Both of these 18 times, 25 times, these are mentioned numerous amounts of times and yet they're not with us here today. And so could have the dinosaurs been here on the earth? Perhaps. Could have they perhaps not survived the flood? Perhaps. It is interesting to consider, but it is also very interesting if they are part of this creation and we do see that amazing plan uh, and amazing creation and some of the creativity and what we were able to see. We didn't want to get into it this, to this evening. There is only a certain amount of time that we are going to look at. There is a great deal of information on carbon dating. And that is something that a lot of people get into. You know, carbon dating says that it has to be this many hundreds of billions of years old, or this many hundreds of thousands of years old. And they're using the decay rate and the carbon of things that were alive. There are some serious flaws, however, in carbon dating. And I would suggest that you look into this yourself. Carbon dating, you know, if you send one piece to analyze to five different labs, you're probably going to get five different ages ranging from 5,000 years to 100,000 years. And so that is one severe challenge is just inside itself. There are challenges with carbon dating. The other real big flaw, if you're a creationist with carbon dating, is that almost no labs take into consideration the flood. You know, the flood, that amount of water, that period of time on organics and what that would have done, even in creation of oil and other things, if you don't take into consideration the flood and other aspects that we would consider to be real, then carbon dating really is hard to apply. And so those are some things that I would, I would encourage you to look into yourself, really try to understand it and try to see where it comes from. Here's one that I found really interesting when I was looking through this and doing this, this study for myself. Um, so on the basis of measurable state space dust, there, this is something that's collected, it, it can be proven, they know how much dust is traveling past the earth and, and have known for some time. Um, it seems probable, so this is the, the moon landing, it seems probable that there might have been anywhere from 50 to 180 feet of loosely packed cosmic dust on the moon's surface. The threat was that our manned lunar would have uh, sunk into this loose layer and never been able to blast off and to return trip to Earth. Of course, all of the prospects were not so grim in nature. We also wanted the first astronauts to plant the American flag on the moon and this was expected to be no problem since it could easily have been tapped into this cosmic dust layer. As the time for the first manned landing approached, much concern and controversy over the moon dust problem remained. In a recent television interview, interview Bob Hope asked Neil Armstrong what his greatest fear was when he set his first historic foot on the moon's surface. And without hesitation, Armstrong responded that his greatest fear was the moon dust layer that scientists had told the astronauts to expect. Many precautions had been taken, additional expensive impact probes had been sent to check for safe landing sites, and most important of all, 
One very crucial addition to the landing vehicle was made huge duck feet landing pods were attached to the legs of the lunar lander so that it would safely settle down without sinking into this theorized dust. When they arrived, the amount of dust on the moon would put the age of the earth at about 10,000 years. And the moon just seems to be this, this measuring stick for us on young earth. The moon is currently moving away from the earth at approximately one and a half inches a year. So that would be about 250 meters over 6,000 year period. That's pretty easy calculation. Currently the moon is about 400,000 kilometers away. However, if you apply the 1.5 billion years it would have taken for the apparent evolution process, when that started, the earth and the moon would literally have to have been touching at that current pace. Again, this would push the earth much younger than evolutions, evolutionists would have you believe. So this is a very measurable fact. It would put the earth through the tides, everything. Nothing would work if the moon was that close. And this is something that is very measurable to understand that we can see this happening. And so we asked the question, you know, we've looked at, we've looked at quite a bit here. Evolution, does it hold up? You know, evolution has a lot of holes. And what's so amazing is it still requires a great deal of faith. You know, science has taken some really large leaps in the conclusions while expecting creation believers to have defined answers. And I, you know, I think this is an important point. I really want to hammer home on this. You know, as a creationist, as a person myself, I do believe in creation. I believe in the creation story. I believe that God created the earth. I have a lot of questions for that. I have a lot of answers that I can't, or a lot of questions to answers I can't get. I'm hoping to one day. I'm hoping that that will be explained. But there are a lot of questions. But I can also see in nature. I can see God's hand. And therefore, I feel the calling. I see a calling to that creator, a responsibility. And I'm willing to admit that. But to follow evolution requires a great deal of faith. And there's no hope. There's no carrot at the end. You're not putting a ton of faith in something that has no future. You just pass away. And that, to me, is almost unbelievable. We have the intricacies of the animal kingdom that just could not have been accidental. And so we ask ourselves perhaps a more important question today, this evening. What, what if creation is real? What if there is a creator? And you, for your whole life, have been sitting there believing in evolution. You've been taught it in school. It's not your fault. But what if there is a creator and you are not answering that call? You're not looking to nature. You're not looking and seeing his creation. And so we ask again, because it is a title, which of them requires more faith? Evolution provides a theory which allows men to escape the responsibility of having a creator or a purpose beyond fulfilling his own needs and desires. It offers an ease of ignorance, resigning oneself to this moment in time as all one has. There is an ease to it. You don't have to attend church. You don't have to live right. It doesn't matter. There is an ease, but you are missing out. You're missing out on the potential hope that you could have. The theory of evolution offers no such possibility of life, no hope beyond our mortality. Brief existence, the belief in a creator, specifically the God of Israel, Yahweh, who so clearly articulates his plan for the earth does. The theory of evolution has various flaws, has various contradicting ideas, philosophies, and it has scientists at the helm steering the ship. It is not sure, nor is it solid. The physical, scientific, observable nature around us provides a sure conclusion evidence that such theories of evolution are wildly unlikely, if not altogether unfathomable. Well, if that's the case, then truly there is hope. If there's a creator, it stands to reason that further investigation into the scriptures, into the Bible, is warranted. Why did he create this earth? Why did he create humans? Is there a purpose to our existence? What's the point? What was the point of us being put here? The God of the Bible, Yahweh, clearly outlines his plan for the earth and the steps he hopes his creation will follow to participate in his plans. One Bible verse 
that is really well known, and I would injure you to, to memorize it if you could. Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. But as surely as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's the point. That's what God put us here for. That's why we were created. And so you might ask the question, who is the creator then? If, if you're so certain who the creator is, well, the God of the Bible, you always described in great detail to us. His name as revealed to Moses and the children of Israel in the book of Exodus is a name that means I am that I am, or I will be who I will be. He is a loving father. He is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, without beginning and end, all wise, all powerful, everywhere present. We cannot be where he is not. He is good, just, righteous, and powerful. His strength cannot be compared, compared to nor his compassion. What a humbling and honored consideration that this all-powerful creator would seek joy in us, in his creation, through our simple obedience, and that he would reward that obedience with eternal life and freedom from death and sickness and suffering. This slide continues, who is the creator? It says, the God of Israel declares to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, that in him would all nations of the earth be blessed. In the New Testament, we are told that God is not a respecter of persons and that there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so there is this open invitation to trust in God, to be part of his plan for salvation. It is an incredible gift that is written in the pages of his word for any and all who would seek to understand. And within, within his word, he has left prophecies and other witnesses to his existence, that by them we might have our faith strengthened, that the very existence of the nation of Israel after thousands of years of oppression and those actively seeking its destruction, it is a witness, the nation of Israel. It is a testament to his unchanging promise. We are seeing a ton of prophecies being fulfilled right now, and that's not our, our topic for this evening, but we can see it if you dig into scriptures. You can see this plan that has been left for us, and you can see it with his nation, the children of Israel. And so what are we told the creation's intentions are? What is that future plan? I've alluded to it two or three times this evening, but what is that end goal? Why put us here? What is the point of the creation? Well, God will send his son, Jesus, back to the earth to establish an everlasting kingdom and will resurrect his faithful servants to life everlasting. The earth will not be destroyed, but rather be restored to its former glory. Revelations 21 verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. He will finish the work that he began in creation. He is in control and will certainly not allow his earth to be destroyed. Micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 says, and this is, it says in the last day. So this is talking about when this, this period comes to a completion. And we're right there. We're right at the end of the 6,000 year plan. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills. And people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up unto the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his highways. And he will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up war against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts have spoken it. The Bible paints this picture in scriptures with hundreds of descriptions of what this kingdom on earth will be like, what that next thousand year millennial plan will be like. We're not going to read all of this. It is a great chapter, Isaiah chapter 35. If you have the time, uh, you can look it up at home and you can read it yourself. We're just going to read the last little portion. Isaiah chapter 35, and a highway shall there be, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring man, those fools that shall not 
not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and shall come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. In the world that we're living in right now, in all the challenges that we're facing, when you read a verse like this, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away, this is the kind of hope that we are looking for. This is the kind of hope that we need to look forward to. The creator is in control. He is actively working to accomplish his plan. There is a set timeline. Acts chapter 17, verse 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. We know that Jesus came, he died, he was raised from the dead. There will be a time when we are judged. That's where this calling comes in. Are we just being lazy? Do we not want to look into the scriptures? Do we not want to look into God? And therefore, it's easy to embark down the path of I believe in evolution. Is that what it is? Because there will be a day where we are judged. And so we endure that you would seek the truth. So as we bring this consideration to a close, we would encourage everyone to open their Bible, to seek the truth. The Bible was written with the intent to be understood by any who are willing to diligently seek it out. We know that Acts chapter 17, verse 11 says, Those that were noble, those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They read their Bibles. They got into it. That's where our hope lies. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. I'd like to thank you for taking time to watch this. Obviously, it has hopefully asked some questions of you. It has asked some questions of what you maybe perhaps believe. And uh, we want to thank you once again for just taking that time to be with us and to watch this. Um, thank you very much.